Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, which is part of our series examining the COVID-19 pandemic through the lens of health and human rights. I have the good fortune of knowing many of you who are on Zoom today, but for those of you who are new to us, I'm Donna McKay, the Executive Director of Physicians for Human Rights, PHR. Uh, for the past four months, we've been bringing together physicians, scientists, civil society leaders and policymakers on a wide ranging set of topics that seek to bring science based analysis and approaches to help guide response to this massive health pandemic. We have um, over 500 people live with us today to hear from expert panelists as they discuss the distinct and dangerous impacts of COVID-19 on refugee encampments in Mexico. Um, specifically, we've decided to focus on the context of Matamoros and Tijuana though these are by no means the only situations where the health conditions of asylum seekers and refugee settings are creating really life-threatening situations. Um, when, we first, when the first case of COVID-19 was reported at the Matamoros encampment in June, PHRs and others immediately called for both local and national health authorities in Mexico to act immediately by improving access to COVID-19 testing and also care. The families living in the Metamoros encampment, like other asylum seekers waiting for U.S. immigration court here, are in dangerous conditions, and effectively they're defenseless against COVID-19 without the necessary access to health care and treatment. And PHR is a consistent, outspoken voice against the Trump administration's anti-immigration agenda and its discriminatory policies that make it harder and harder for people to seek refuge in the United States and easier for COVID-19 to spread in encampments like Matamoros. I'm, I'm really humbled to welcome such esteemed panelists today. We're so fortunate to have the opportunity to hear from people who are working on the front lines doing Herculean work uh, to protect the well-being of asylum seekers in the face of this pandemic and to be advocates on their behalf. Um, so today's moderator, we're very fortunate to have Vidya Kumar Ramanathan, who is a practicing pediatric emergency physician at St. Joseph Mercy Ann Arbor Hospital and also medical director of the University of Michigan's Asylum Collaborative. She serves as a physician expert for PHR and a member of our asylum network, which consists of a team of volunteer clinicians who provide pro bono medical and psychological examinations of asylum seekers to support their applications for the protection in the United States. Um, so last month, uh, Vidya authored a very powerful piece titled, It's Time to Live Up to Our National Moral Conscience, in which she calls on the US government to recognize its responsibility to help its neighbors through this health crisis, especially asylum seekers. Informed by her experience helping asylum seekers in Mexico as a PHR medical expert, she wrote, and I quote, it's a fallacy to believe that our national attention can or should be only on ourselves. So I now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Donna, for that kind introduction and PHR for having me here today. What a great honor it is to be here with these esteemed panelists, as you say, and so many incredible people from the greater human rights community joining us here in the audience. Thanks so much. I first visited the detention center at Dilly, Texas, in the days following the public knowledge and outcry about this administration's family separation policies. Then, and in my subsequent visits to Matamoros, I've learned that what we know is really just the tip of this alarming iceberg. Crowded conditions and poor access to sanitation and hygiene at detention centers and border tent encampments set up the perfect storm for the devastation of a pandemic. The Trump administration's policies, which used the fear of spreading COVID-19 as a justification for closing the border, are actually causing great harm. To be clear, the crowded conditions at the border encampments are a direct result of US policy decisions to restrict access to asylum. A recent study out of UC San Diego found that out of several hundred asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border, an overwhelming majority have friends or family that they could safely shelter in place with here in the United States, preventing the spread of the virus. There is no need for mass quarantine 
or for keeping thousands of people together at the border in unsafe conditions. We are just finding out that thousands of migrant children have been expelled from the US since March under an emergency health order from the Trump administration. We as a public health and human rights community must speak out to change these cruel and dangerous policies. There is in fact new regulation trying to block asylum for people on the basis of non-standard health claims. We are putting out a call to action as they are taking public comments for this up until August 10th. We will be putting the link in the chat box as one of the action items for all of you to do right away. We'll be hearing today from four wonderful speakers who will each give brief opening remarks and then we will spend the second half of this session on the Q&A portion. We encourage you to please enter your questions in the Q&A box as they come up. We are so lucky today to get to hear from experts who will give us a look at this issue from different perspectives. I'm so thrilled that we will be able to hear first about the policies that this administration is putting in place and what implication they will have for the people who are seeking protection here. Then we will get an on the ground perspective from the border and following that, we will hear about what clinicians can actually do. And finally, we will hear a moving personal narrative. It is my great pleasure to begin by introducing Ms. Astrid Dominguez, who will give us the legal landscape on which all of this is based. Astrid Dominguez is the director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Texas's Border Rights Center, which works with border communities to fight for safe and effective border policies and protect the U.S.'s constitutional guarantees of equality and justice for all families. Astrid? Thank you, Vidya, and thank you, Donna, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to have this very important conversation about what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border. Let me start by saying that in December of 2018, the then-Secretary of Homeland Security, Kristen Nielsen, announced the Migration Protection Protocol also known as the Remaining Mexico program, which changed drastically the procedures for seeking asylum at our U.S.-Mexico border. Under this program, asylum seekers fleeing violence and persecution in their home countries would now be forced to wait in Mexico while their cases were processed in the United States. Since the program started, the harms of MPP have been well documented by different organizations, such as Human Rights First, WOLA, us at the ACLU Border Rights Center, among others. 60,000 plus migrants have been returned to Mexico, facing homelessness, kidnapping, sexual assault, extortion, and disappearances. In September of last year, the ACLU of Texas Border Rights Center filed a complaint demanding an immediate end to the practice of returning pregnant women to Mexico under the MPP program and a full investigation into the practice. The complaint featured numerous stories of pregnant women who were forced to return to Mexico and exposed CBP's violation of its own NPP guidance, which placed pregnant women in immediate danger. The ACLU quickly filed a class action lawsuit challenging NPP. However, despite winning decisive decisions at both the district court and appeals court levels, finding NPP clearly unlawful, the Supreme Court stepped in in to allow the policy to continue while litigation moves forward. Ever since MPP was rolled out, us advocates have been warning of the dangers this illegal policy represents for immigrants and the asylum system. Now add a pandemic into the mix and you have a recipe for disaster. Since March, Dean Chaff has used the pandemic as a pretext to reschedule all MPP hearings without clear guidelines on how people in MPP were meant to get notice of the change in their hearing. DHS also stopped most non-refoulement interviews, meaning people stuck in Mexico could no longer, even with the assistance of a lawyer, get an interview based on immediate dangers they face while waiting in Mexico. That same month, as the pandemic grew in the US and the government's failure to respond accordingly, they did take a drastic and unjustified action at the border. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, 
issued an order upon which CBP relied to institute a policy of summarily deporting all asylum seekers who arrive at the border, many times within just hours. This policy uses the COVID-19 public health crisis as a pretext to achieve the long-held goals of the Trump administration to end asylum at the border. The public health law that they use as a justification does not in fact authorize such, sum such summary deportation. Through these unlawful actions, this administration has effectively ended access to asylum at the U.S. border. More than 40,000 people have been expelled since March under the CDC order, including hundreds of unaccompanied children. We have thus far challenged the CDC order and summary expulsion policy through several lawsuits on behalf of unaccompanied children. The only federal judge, a Trump appointee, to have reviewed the legality of the policy, found serious problems and ruled that we were likely to win the merits on the case. The case on the merits. We continue to explore all legal avenues to challenge this unlawful summary deportation. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Astrid, for setting the stage for us so well. Next, we will hear from Helen Perry about what is happening on the ground in Matamoros. Helen Perry is the Executive Director of Global Response Management, which delivers emergency medical care and humanitarian relief in high-risk areas, including Matamoros, Mexico. She is a United States Army Nurse Corps veteran and practicing acute care nurse practitioner. Thank you so much for your service, Helen. Thank you, and thank you guys for having me. Um, so the, the COVID situation in Matamoros is forever evolving. Um, back in February, we were one of the earliest groups to keep an eye on it and to recognize that COVID was going to become especially impactful in the refugee settings that, that we're exposed to, whether it be in Syria, in Matamoros, uh, in Bangladesh, anywhere really in the world. And so back in February, we started actually implementing prevention and fortification measures with the understanding that it was just a matter of time before COVID made its way to the camp. Um, one of the ways that we did that was actually looking at an evidence-based review of recommendations that are effective in specifically uh, refugee situations. So the, the strategies that we use public health-wise in refugee camps is very different than the strategies that we use, say, in the United States, where social distancing and isolation are actually feasible um, you know, objectives. Um, in refugee situations where bathrooms, showers, kitchens are all communal, those strategies have to be modified to actually be effective. And one of the, the areas that we researched was actually looking at the 1918 British Army's field epidemiology guidelines for the Spanish flu pandemic, because that was the closest that we could find in similar living situations in a similar type of pandemic-like situation. And we actually pulled out some very helpful recommendations from that uh, that we use to kind of guide our practices in the camp. Things like instructing people to mop instead of sweep, because when you're sweeping, you're aerosolizing viral particulates into the air. You know, recommending face masks, even if they were cloth. That was very, very common for, for the, the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, recommending sanitation crews go throughout the camp and spray down any standing surface, so doorknobs, handles, tables, anything that somebody could potentially touch. And then the thing that we did that was a little step extra beyond that was we actually recognized very early on the transmission capabilities from bathroom settings and the fact that we're using porta potties in Matamoros. Every one of our bathrooms is sanitized between every single use of every person at all times. And so with those strategies, we were actually able to keep the COVID-19 out of the camp up until June 25th of this year. And we were doing surveillance testing to, to keep an eye on it. Um, the way that we test is using antibody testing. PCR testing is still incredibly limited throughout uh, Matamoros and in Mexico. And, it's, and the government actually controls who gets tested and who doesn't. And so that creates a variety of problems uh, for us. And our, our best solution that we could come up with was antibody testing and isolation based on that, as well as based on symptomology, because antibody testing isn't perfect. 
they have to have a high enough uh, antibody load to actually show up on those tests. Um, since uh, June 25th, we've had about 53 cases in the camp that are antibody positive. Only four of those have tested positive at the state lab. Now, we know that there are certain intrinsic problems with state testing. We know that they're not always testing appropriately. We know that they're not always using the appropriate viral medium swabs. And since we're not the ones doing the actual test, it's very hard for us to certify that it's being done properly. <laughs> so things that have complicated what's going on in Matamoros are the fact that we just had Hurricane Hannah come through, which had almost a direct hit on the camp. We had uh, some wind damage, but we've also had significant flooding, which has displaced, already displaced individuals and, and created sort of um, even worse sanitation issues than we've had in the past. Um, in Matamoros currently, in the city itself, there are over 3,500 positive cases, and that number is likely to be significantly higher. So now on top of you know, an already serious COVID problem, we also now have the problems that come with flooding, things like gastrointestinal illnesses, vector-borne diseases from mosquitoes like chukungunya, dengue, um, you know, the rashes that people get from walking through, you know, pretty gross flood water. Um, and then there's the added fact that the hospitals have all closed to patients. Uh, the public hospitals have closed to anyone who does not have a life or death emergency. They're not even taking our OBGYN patients when we refer them. And the private hospitals have all closed to anyone with symptoms that could be COVID-19. On top of that, in addition to MPP restrictions, we now also do not have the ability to get emergent um, um, crossing of patients into the United States who may need more significant medical care than what is capable of being provided in Matamoros. And so all of this together creates a pretty dire situation for the camp. Uh, the background that I have, as you can see, is actually our field hospital that's set up Right now, that field hospital has about 18 inches of water still standing in it as we're waiting for the floodwaters to recede. Gosh, thank you so much, Helen. That was scary, but really important for all of us to hear. Uh, now we'll hear, uh, next we'll hear from Dr. Sandra Crosby for an overview of the medical issues and also what clinicians can actually do Dr. Crosby is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the Boston University School of Medicine and an internist focused on the care of asylum seekers, asylees, and refugees. And she's the former co-director of the Boston Center for the Refugee Health and Human Rights at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Crosby has supported PHR's work as a trainer on documenting physical and psychological evidence of torture and notably, she is serving as a drafter on the Istanbul Protocol Supplement Project. Dr. Crosby. Thank you, Vija, PHR, um, and fellow panelists. Helen, that was um, just astonishing. Thank you um, for your picture on the ground. I visited Metamoris um, in the fall, and this was prior to COVID-19 and, and prior, I believe, to your work there. Um, and then I witnessed the horrid conditions and human suffering in this makeshift encampment. Um, at the time, I was very alarmed by the number of pregnant women I observed um, who had been returned to the encampment under the MPP protocol um, that I felt was endangering not only their lives, but the health and lives of their babies. I, as a PHR member, I submitted a complaint to the Office of the Inspector General um, at the Department of Homeland Security that was prepared by the ACLU Border Rights Center and ACLU of Texas um, that we heard from earlier. It, um, it's, again, it's still under litigation. The inhumane treatment and suffering of thousands of asylum seekers in Matamoros and other encampments as a result of US policies has been exponentially compounded by this current COVID-19 pandemic. Asylum seekers crossing the border, recall, are seeking refuge from persecution. Torture, sexual assault, witnessing the murder of relatives, 
and other unspeakable acts. Even prior to COVID, they were a severely traumatized um, and vulnerable population who carried a heavy burden of pre-existing mental and physical health conditions as a result of their experiences and the harsh, harsh conditions um, that, that Helen has described. And we will certainly provide links to, to data supporting that. The amplified impact of the COVID pandemic um, in this environment, I think has really challenged us in unprecedented ways that we've heard. Um, the cramped living space is intense, limited access to medical care, makeshift unsanitary um, latrines, unhygienic environment, poor nutrition, um, limited vaccinations, all create the perfect storm for a disaster in this pandemic. It would spread like wildfire if it takes hold. I, I think people on the ground are doing an incredible job. The other issue is that it could also devastate the pool of public health workers um, and other people providing services um, in these areas. The administration has proposed a rule um, effectively using COVID pandemic as an excuse as a border ban. And this is, um, quite unbelievable. This ruling gives immigration enfor enforcement um, authority to remove asylum seekers, including children, under the guise of public health. The order operates um, completely outside of the normal immigration process, eliminating, eliminating um, refugee protection obligations and has no public health merit. Returning people to encampments such as Matamoras um, is exactly the opposite of what we want to be doing to limit the pandemic. Um, we would want to be allowing people um, to live with their sponsors and to self-isolate and self-quarantine in safer conditions. Of another concern the COVID pandemic has further restricted um, asylum seekers access to immigration attorneys and also to clinicians who perform medical evaluations um, to, support, so, to support their asylum claims. Um, and again, this is all in the backdrop of what Estreed has talked about, of a string of really draconian restrictive asylum rules that seem to be intended to prevent people from seeking asylum in the U.S. I think now is an opportunity for clinicians to be innovative, um, to attack this problem, um, to partner with legal organizations such as the ACLU, with organizations such as PHR, um, and perform evaluations. You know, before COVID, I had never done a video link medical evaluation, and you know, now we we just had to adjust and and learn how to do that. Um, and that's just one example. Clinicians can and should make good trouble, and we will provide action, action items at the end of, of this webinar. Absolutely, thank you so much, um, Dr. Crosby. You know, um, I think people are really moved to action. Uh, we're getting a lot of comments about that, so um, I think that's really important for all of us in this community. Um, and finally, Last but certainly not least, uh, we'll be hearing a really pers moving personal nar narrative from Mr. Jose Mares to bring all of this together. Jose Mares is the Tijuana Logistics Coordinator for Al Otro Lado, a legal services organization serving indigent deportees, refugees, and asylees in Mexico. Born in Mexico, Mr. Mares lived in the United States for almost three decades before being deported and separated from his daughter in early 2017. Jose? Hello, thank you, Vidya. I, I wanna thank Vidya, I wanna thank all my fellow panelists for having me. Um, I was one of the first persons to be deported by the Trump administration. This happened in February 19th, February 9th of 2017. And I've been living in Tijuana ever since. I was a single father of my 17 year old daughter whom I raised since she was three and a half years old. That morning on February 9th, my daughter was driving me to work and luckily she didn't see the six ICE agents that rushed me, put me in handcuffs and into an armored van. 
This happened around 7.30 a.m. And by 10 p.m., I was already in Tijuana. When I first arrived in Tijuana, I was constantly harassed and threatened with jail by police because I didn't have an ID or any kind of documents. But thankfully, soon after I was deported, I connected with Al Otro Lado and started working with them. I was able to help other deportees obtain their documents and help reintegrate themselves back into society here in Tijuana. I have also worked with hundreds of refugees and immigrants since I started working with Al Otro Lado. I have seen firsthand the mistreatment, the suffering and the hardships that deportees, refugees and immigrants face from day to day. Unable to receive even basic medical care, a safe place to sleep or a warm meal to eat. The shelters that are in place in Tijuana are usually overcrowded, unsanitary and unsafe. Things were already very hard for those stuck here. And then came MPP and the pandemic. Once MPP was implemented, it put an even bigger strain on shelters, organizations and volunteers at border crisis, at border cities, excuse me. Al otro lado set up MPP clinics in Tijuana. We provided meals and information for people waiting for their court dates or, or their numbers in the infamous list to come up. Others were helped with document translations and general support throughout their forced stay in Tijuana. The pandemic put a hold on a lot of people's lives around the world. Migrants and refugees who were fortunate to find employment started to lose their jobs. They faced eviction because they were unable to pay rent and families started to go hungry with no food on the table. Al otro lado provided over 200 prepaid debit cards with 4,000 pesos to migrants to help with basic needs for up to two months. Some medical vulnerable families were, taking, were taken out of shelters and housed to help them out. Government offices closed down because of the pandemic. So people being deported were not able to obtain any of the necessary documents like an ID or a birth certificate. And without those, you can't do anything in Tijuana. And you also run the risk of being thrown in jail because you're labeled as an indigent. People in MPP are stuck along the border indefinitely. MPP courts are closed and so is the southern border of Mexico. So even if they wanted to go back home, they couldn't. So then we get whole families having to live in these shelters or 10 cities with no end in sight. COVID-19 disrupted the lives of many people all over the world, but it's become a living hell if you're an immigrant, refugee, or a deportee living in Tijuana or Matamoros. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. That was, um, that was hard to hear, but thank you so much for that. Okay, so we're getting a lot of questions for all of you. Um, we will group them as best as we can and um, go through as many of the questions as we can. Thank you so much to all of you for asking your questions and thank you so much to the panelists for your uh, expert input. Okay, we're going to start with Helen Perry. Um, people are asking, do the health workers all have adequate PPE? Does everyone in the camp have a mask? And how are isolation and quarantine measures being managed at the border encampment? Um, so I can only speak for my teams in terms of PPE. Um, I know that in the city of Matamoros and all throughout the state of Tamaulipas, uh, the PPE situation varies significantly. For my team, we all have more than sufficient PPE for our teams. Um, we actually developed our decontamination and our isolation PPE protocols based on actually Ebola standards because when we were starting to prepare for COVID, we recognized that there was a lot that we didn't know about how it was being transmitted and, and its, uh, its r not capabilities and it's, you know, the, the risk of contamination and infection. So we specifically actually elected to have a higher level of decontamination than, than what is sort of generally accepted. Um, so my, my teams all have PPE. Now that doesn't, you know, it, it, people are always asking about sending in cloth masks into the camp and we tell them, yes, please keep sending them, uh, especially with the recent floods. Many of the individuals leaving, living in the camps have lost, if not everything, near everything to include the masks. Uh, I can't say that, not, that everyone in the camp has a mask. We have tried uh, and we've distributed thousands of them over the course of months. Um, but the challenge, there, there's also other unique challenges in terms of, of uh, not just mask education, but, but COVID education in general. We're working with a population that has a very low health education. They don't always understand why wearing a mask is so vital when they've been exposed to other conditions in the camp that they didn't need a mask for. Um, there's a lot of 
concern in especially in some of the the camp population that this is a hoax just like we hear from you know average american citizens um and so those are all factors that we're having to mitigate in terms of um you know getting sort of compliance and best practices throughout our our camp population in terms of isolation and how that's being handled um we have multiple different isolation areas or we had multiple isolation areas up until the hurricane. Currently, the majority of those areas are flooded and we are unable at this time to actually effectively isolate people because the Mexican government actually controls how far in the camp space we can actually relocate certain items. So it's not like we just have never ending fields of territory where we can expand to make up for the flooded areas that we can no longer use. Um, to give you an idea over the course, since, since we started testing, which I believe was in uh, late March, early April, we've done over 838 tests, uh, rapid antibody tests that we have that are validated as being highly sensitive and specific. And of those, like we discussed earlier, the 53 are now positive, And we've had those 53 since, um, June 25th. Okay, thank you so much. That's, that's good to hear. Um, so, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in the audience are just really moved to action and they, uh, they really want to help in many different kinds of ways. So, Sandra, I think people would really like to know what else they can do in addition to donating money or donating goods. Um, maybe could you please explain a little bit more about the latest asylum ban that the administration is trying to put into place? What types of public comments are we looking for audience members to enter? Um, sure, this is really an important and timely situation that is ongoing right now. So just to reiterate, um, the administration has proposed a rule that would label asylum seekers as, quote, threat to national security, unquote, on completely basis public health grounds, um, i.e. risk of spreading COVID. Um, and this means that the border officials would have the authority to immediately deport asylum seekers without an asylum hearing back to countries where they could be tortured or even killed. Um, and the important thing to know is this ruling makes absolutely no public health sense. It is not based in any science. Um, the ban applies not to individual people, um, but they, anybody at risk is at risk and could be deported merely for having transited through a country with COVID. And as we know, that's essentially any country in the world right now. Um, the rule also gives authority to declare other treatable diseases as national security threats, um, i.e. things like gonorrhea, syphilis, or tuberculosis, which we all know are completely treatable diseases. Again, um, it also applies to asylum seekers living in the United States who may have had contact with COVID positive patients. And when I think about all of the asylum, thousands of asylum seekers I know, many of them are in healthcare um, and could be affected by this ruling. Um, the determination about whether somebody is a national security risk is made by unqualified government officials, not by public health experts. Um, and we know there are established screening and treatment measures um, for COVID, and some of which Helen um, has discussed are going on in Matamoros. And you know, we also know that uh, as part of this, people should not be held in congregate settings, um, and that could be encampments like Matamoros or in ICE detention centers. Um, they should be released pending adjudication of their asylum hearings to family members or sponsors. Um, and again, utilizing the CDC guidelines we're all familiar with. The rule here is completely discriminatory and baseless on public health charges. Um, and I think the real threat here, obviously is not the asylum seekers, but the failure of the US to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. And this, 
this ruling, if it goes through, could have tremendous consequences and really shut down asylum to people who desperately need it. And that's why we would encourage everybody to, su to submit comments in opposition of this proposed ruling um, by August 10th. And we will provide information on um, how to do that. In addition, we'll provide a, um, a letter that was sent to the Attorney General and Homeland Security by a long list of uh, public health experts um, and, and is available today that will give um, some guidance on some in more detail about the public health issues at hand. You know, other things to do, um, I, would, I would really um, encourage people to um, volunteer to do medical evaluations for asylum seekers and partner with PHR. Um, there are some fantastic webinars on how to do long distance or video link um, both physical and psychological health assessments, um, which tremendously benefit asylum seekers in their cases. Um, writing letters to your legislators, um, testifying in Congress. Um, there are there are um, numerous ways you know, that people can help, um, in addition to providing money, supporting organizations like Helen's, um, and volunteering. Fantastic, yeah, and absolutely. And also, of course, writing op-eds. You know, um, I think a lot of people are really prolific at that. And um, the more we get the word out there is really, really great and important. So thank can you I so make much. A, can I make a quick point on the recent changes that they're asking to be implemented? Is it, it doesn't just apply to COVID. It actually would apply to other diseases such as gonorrhea, syphilis, yeah. um, things like that, which would be ironic considering that there are places in the United States that are considered pretty epidemic with, with syphilis and gonorrhea. So um, this is from, from a GRM's perspective, we have seen this all along as a ploy to end asylum because literally anywhere along the Northern routes, you could come in contact with any number of infectious diseases and, and not just from Central and South America, but also when you start talking about West Africa, the Middle East, it's, it's nearly impossible to transit those countries without going through some level of infectious disease exposure. Yeah, absolutely. Completely, yes. All right, um, Astrid, um, you know, I think that um, a lot of people also feel some outrage about how these policies are even being implemented or how it's even possible that things like this can happen um, kind of right under our nose. So do you think you could please give us an update about the new information that's coming out about the thousands of migrant children who have been expelled from the U.S.? Um, since March, uh, this information that's just been coming out this week. I understand that they have not been deported. They actually just were outright expelled. Um, these children were recently famously seen in the windows of hotels um, in Texas. Uh, so how can this be legal? Uh, somebody asked, is there any action being taken against either the U.S. or Mexican government about any of this? Uh, yes, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So um, after the CDC um, issued that order that um, allows them to um, pretty much um, expel migrants um, in, a, in a fast way, um, this has had also an impact on unaccompanied children. Now, children and kids are entitled to special protections under the law. And what we're seeing right now is that instead of um, the U.S. government to provide, provide those protections and um, taking kids into for our custody, which is, you know, what usually happens when unaccompanied children show up at the border, um, you know, they are in custody of CDP while they get processed, then they need to be immediately sent to ORR, um, so they are in custody of ORR. And what's happening right now is they are not officially deporting these kids, like they're not going to, to an immigration judge who then orders them removed, which takes a long time, right? It doesn't happen overnight, um, but they are just expelling them. Um, so they're skipping all these pro you know, um, procedures that um, would then um, provide sometimes protection for these kids. Um, so, you know, they're, um, you know, including their right to have their asylum claims adjudicated by a judge. So, 
um, while doing this, they're, um, they're not going to or are um, custody, so they're skipping that. Um, and you know the, the removal proceeding. So they're kept in hotels that are secret. No one knows where the kids are. Um, you know, we don't know whether they have access to phones. Um, they're held by a by a private contractor who um, is not licensed, um, and they have a poor track record of holding children in unacceptable conditions. You know, from family separation. Um, so uh, we, you know, if this is extremely concerning. Um, I mean, they, you know, the, the, the government claims they can do this because of public health reasons, but the ORR system has, um, you know, they can, they have the capacity to hold children up to 6,000, and they're not anywhere near, like, that number. Um, so if, if this was really a claim about, you know, we need to keep them safe, they do have space to keep these children in custody. Um, and, and just expelling them without any new process. So um, we did... Um, challenge the CDC order um, on behalf of unaccompanied children. And, um, you know, they, uh, they have reviewed the legality policy and they have found um, that we were likely to win the case on the merits. So we continue to explore all these um, legal avenues of challenges and unlawful um, summer deportation. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so Jose, uh, People are asking, is the government of Mexico helping people at these refugee camps? And maybe a brief overview of what are some of the basic needs that are there for those people? Oh, I think you're muted, Jose. As far as the government in Mexico, they're not really giving uh, like any kind of financial aid uh, to people in uh, refugee camps. Um, well, we know in here in Tijuana, they've helped with uh, just like basic food baskets, you know, they have like, you know, they have like rice, beans, you know, just, uh, you know, just the basic things. But as far as uh, giving financial help, they're not giving really any financial help to, to the people in the shelters. Okay. All right. That's, that's bad. All right. So there is an excellent question here. Oh, did somebody else want to jump in? Oh, I don't think so. Okay. There's an excellent question here for all of the attendees. Is there any concern that the government would be able to access healthcare records for asylum seekers? If we are seeing these patients in clinic and screening for infectious diseases, should we be worried about this? Um, who might start? Maybe, um, maybe Helen, would you like to start with that? Sure. Um, so GRM specifically does not share any patient information with either government, whether that be the American government or uh, the Mexican government, unless the patient specifically asks us to. We also have a system set up that allows us to allow patients to seek medical care using pseudonyms or aliases if they feel like their identity is somehow at risk and that could be compromised. Um, we also abide by the policy of the right to be forgotten, which is that if they ever asked us to completely delete all of their information, we would comply with that because we understand the vulnerability of their situation. In the United States, I would say that we should be affording them, especially for individuals who may be undocumented, we should be affording them the same rights. Um, we've seen, you know, recently in the news that um, different agencies have been using pretty questionably ethical, if not just straight up unethical practices to identify uh, undocumented individuals that could then be deported. Um, and I think that from, as a medical professional, my first and foremost responsibility is to make sure that I am not accidentally doing harm um, by putting a patient in a position where they could be, you know, identified and deported for being undocumented or that their medical conditions could then be used against them. Uh, for any reason. So we are very conscientious of that and it's, it's a valid concern. Excellent. I, I would just like to echo that I believe this is a valid concern. This is something we have been discussing even prior to this, this um, most recent public health ban. Um, and we've been having discussions about what to put in medical records, to not put immigration information in medical records. Um, 
because even though by law the information is protected, there are loopholes and ways that if the government really wanted to, um, they could access it. And that's been the guidance we've been giving our clinicians is um, really to be very careful about what you document because it could be retrievable, um, although we hope not. So I completely agree with, uh, with Helen. Um, and unfortunately, in the US, on the US side, we can't make records disappear. So it's, it's really um, you know, much more important that we're very careful about what we document. That is a unique benefit of working internationally is that we, we have the ability to, um, we actually do provide them with copies if they want it. And to date, we've never been asked, but it's, it's something that we do have the capability for if it should be ever become a concern. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Astrid, somebody has asked, what's the difference between deportation versus being expelled? Can you comment on that? Um, Sure, Vidya. And, and, and just full disclosure, I am not an attorney, so I will try to respond to the best of my ability. So the difference between like kids being expelled versus kids being deported right now. So um, for a, kid, a child to be deported, there needs to be a deportation order. So a judge, a judge is the one that's ordering that child to be removed. But before a judge actually does that like they, the child had to go through a you know, process so they, uh, you know they, they, they pretty much uh, had um, had a case uh, and stated a case about like why um, you know they should not be deported and either you know the judge you know found out there is a plan for the child to stay um, but in this case or not in this case kid being expelled, the child is not going through that process, which is, it's not, like I mentioned, it doesn't happen overnight. And there are laws in place that protect children from just being sent back to possible danger. So we want to make sure that if we're going to send back a child, that child does not, uh, it will not be in danger. Um, and especially if children to Central America, they can't just be sent back overnight. So this process needs to, to happen. And what the U.S. government is doing right now, it's keeping all that all that stuff and just sending them back. Um, so they're like cutting um, this very important um, immigration um, uh, proceeding. Um, and you know, they, they, there isn't a judge ruling. Um, these children don't have um, access to a lawyer. I mean, even though children and, and immigration um, proceedings sometimes don't have access to that either. Um, but in this case, they're, you know, once they go to RR, they, they're there to see a social worker, an attorney, and here they're just putting children in hotel. They're, the attorneys or um, legal providers have no idea where they are, no, nor any way to actually, actually locate the children. Um, so, you know, with um, advocates and um, attorneys, um, you know, realize this was happening because families were getting in touch with them. Um, so they're just, you know, sending them back without any due process. Um, and all of this is happening, you know, in, in the shadows, like we don't know. Um, the the um, acting CBT commissioner uh, said that more than 2,000 unaccompanied children had been expelled as of, as of June 20, 25th. Um, so this is extremely concerning um, because there are laws in place um, that we have to protect children, and the U.S. government is just ignoring all of those, um, claiming you know a health um, uh, emergency. Um, so they just are sending them back um, instead of protecting the children. Gosh. So there are a lot of questions about um, what's happening on the ground. So I'll try to group them a little bit, um, both in Matamoros and in Tijuana. Um, so for Matamoros, um, there are some questions about how, you know, there, we know that there aren't enough ventilators, for example, there. So um, what do you do then for people who require higher level care? Are they able to go across the border? Um, and if not, then what are you doing for them? And also, how has it been with, um, with the recent Hurricane Hannah? Have there been more cases of COVID since then? So 
Um, the hard reality for us is that there are eight ventilators in the city of Matamoros, which is a city of 500,000 people. Like I stated earlier, the hospitals are currently closed, specifically the private hospitals to anyone with COVID symptoms. And even getting care at the public hospitals is extremely difficult, if not impossible. So what that means practically is that anyone who requires ventilator level care is going to go into palliative care. And we have had some very hard discussions internally um, and with our providers about ethically and, and morally, how do we navigate this knowing that we do not have access to higher levels of care. The nearest ICU that we could realistically even possibly get someone to is actually in Reynosa, which has a more significant COVID outbreak than in Matamoros. And that would require us to send them uh, in a transport along Highway 200, which is one of the most dangerous roads in Mexico and is currently not safe for travel. Um, on top of the fact that Matamoros does not have an ACLS transport, they have no way to manage these individuals. So the hard reality is that they would die. And, and while we have not had any deaths in our camp currently, we're very lucky that the cases we've seen have been very mild. Um, that that's not likely to last forever. And we know that, um, which is what makes this situation. And, and that's not, this situation is not unique to us. They're seeing the same things in Iraq, Syria, and in Bangladesh, where access to care and resources is incredibly limited. Um, in terms of the changes we've seen since Hurricane Hannah, we are expecting to see an increase in cases because um, the camp has been sort of internally displaced uh, with lots of moving around and people coming in contact, you know, possessions have been destroyed. Um, but it's, you know, we're doing the best we can. Currently, we don't have the ability to isolate, like I said, because everything is uh, currently flooded in that area. And so we're trying to manage it the best we can by sending teams out to check on our patients that we know are sick and to get them early interventions as much as possible in the hopes that we can prevent the, the moderate cases from from becoming severe. Thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, I know that people also want to hear about so much more, but unfortunately, it looks like our hour has just flown by so quickly. Um, and this just goes to show that there's just so much interest um, in the work and in the um, tremendous work that all each one of you is doing. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us your expertise and for um, really enlightening us um, about this important work. Um, and I think the real truth is that each person has the capacity to speak out and to talk about why this is important to them and why human rights are important. You know, um, it's not just a matter of um, some one person working in a, in a bubble, but really all of us work together and we are a real, um, re a real community who can um, create real change by working together. So thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it back over to Donna McKay from DHR. Coming back on. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate this remarkable panel today, and uh, and for those of you who um, who stayed with us, uh, more than 500, we really appreciate it. It was so enlightening. Um, you know, the rules that we talked about earlier imposed by the administration have created inhumane conditions at the border and a massive health crisis and grave violations of human rights. And the fact that it's happening in the midst of a global health pandemic is only exacerbating the situation. I think you know what we heard today is yet another example of how the COVID pandemic is having a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable in our societies and minority communities. Um, and, and I'm struck by hearing the important perspective today from our health professionals. And it demonstrates to me exactly why health professionals should be guiding our policies related to COVID. Um, policies driven by political agendas have put lives at risk and should have no place during the greatest uh, pandemic of my lifetime. Sandra Crosby described ways to use health professional skill sets to assist asylum seekers and immigrants is another way. Um, and health professionals can use their voices to speak out about the wrongful policies and, the, um, and, can, and can propose humane alternatives. And you are 
Um, increasingly, you all are. Since the family separation policy became known, PHR's list of activist members has grown fivefold, and we're doing everything we can to give them a platform to have their voices heard. Um, if you aren't a member, please do sign up. But it, I'm also struck on the panel by how much more powerful this is when we join together with the legal organizations and community organizers who are on the front line doing amazing work, such as our panelists today. You really are remarkable fighting a critical battle that right now is really life or death. Um, Jose, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and in spite of the challenges, all of the work that you are doing um, to improve the lives of others and, uh, and really, really appreciate you being here. It's very powerful um, in our advocacy. And, um, and Vidya, thank you for leading this terrific panel. Uh, next week's panel on August 12th, which is Wednesday, will be a conversation how COVID-19 has impacted elderly and nursing home populations. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that. And thank you so much again to all of our amazing panelists for the work that you do every day. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.